Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel as well as the History of Faerun series. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week. Continuing with our remastered series of videos covering all aspects of giant lore for the Forgotten Realms, the culture, religion, and pantheon of the giants. When I first delved into the lore of the giants, I was confused by the fact that Anam, the Allfather, creator god of the giant pantheon, had two sets of offspring. But it became clearer that while the various races of giants are all descended from his terrestrial sons, that he sired with the goddess Othea, he previously had many divine children with other divine beings, including an unknown sky goddess. And it is those divine sons that form the pantheon of the giants while Anam's terrestrial children, all demigods, are revered progenitors of the giants themselves. The majority of this video is quoting directly from the source book titled Giant Craft, written by Ray Weninger for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 2nd Edition, published by TSR in September 1995. The source book is set in 1366DR, 127 years prior to the current date of 1493DR in 5th Edition D&D. It is, without a doubt, the authority on all aspects of giant culture in Faerun. However, I have admitted the plot line that was involved in that source book, which was later resolved in a series of novels. First, a note on the clerics of the giants and their special role in giant society, and a note on the ordning. The ordning is extremely important to all giants. It is essentially their system for ranking each other. The pecking order starts with what sort of giant the individual is, so a storm giant outranks a cloud giant who outranks a fire giant who outranks a stone giant, and so on. And then, within their own breed, giants judge their worth on qualities that kind of hold they, their kind hold in high regard. So for stone giants, it is their artistic skill. For frost giants, it's wrestling, drinking, and boasting of their exploits. The basis of the ordning is always pretty easy for the giants within their breed to understand. After all, it's integral to their culture, and each is raised within this tradition, making ordning disputes easy to resolve. To rise in the ordning, one simply openly challenges a superior to a contest in some aspect of what that breed of giant holds to be the measure of a giant's worth. Challengers who win change ordning rankings with the superiors they've bested. Some tribes place no restrictions upon such contests, while others have devised special rules dictating when and if challenges may be issued. Violating the ordning is a serious crime and despicable act among the giants, which they call morgue, dishonourable, shameful, unworthy. Although the ordning ranks measure the giant station within their own tribes, the customary greeting between giants of two different tribes of the same breed includes an oral exchange of ranks, as well as their lineage. Though a giant is under no obligation to treat a higher ranking giant for another tri from another tribe as a superior, any other reaction is a blatant insult. Two giants of different breeds always ignore, ignore their respective inter-tribal ranks because the rank of their breed supersedes any other ranks. So the runt of a frost giant, giant tribe automatically outranks the chieftain of a stone giant tribe. Although giant priests and shamans rarely occupy the top spot within their tribes, an old Astorian custom allows two priests of different tribes to band together and temporarily overrule both their chieftains. Whenever two tribes stand in conflict, the highest ranking holy man and each side have the authority to jointly call a parley to resolve the situation. During such a parley, the holy men work together to discuss the will of Anam. If they reach a consensus, their decision is traditionally binding upon both tribal leaders. This custom is said to have originated with the titan Lanaxis, who forced it upon his subjects. Though many priests like to perpetuate the myth that clerical parlays are solved through complex religious rites and magical divination, the simple truth is that they are usually little more than a power brokering session in the background. These days, with the giants much reduced in number, this is very rarely an issue, and in general, the holy men of each tribe stand in close accord with the wishes of their chieftains anyway. But... This video is dedicated to learning of the religion of the giants, so first, let's examine Anam himself. As a creator god, he has no lineage himself, he was simply born of the confluence of law and chaos, and as various species across the multiverse came to revere and worship the aspect of reality that Anam is most in tune with, so he and they became linked, and he took on elements of their belief in him, manifesting as a physical form more in keeping with what they believed he would look like. 
There are a lot of variations, but generally speaking, the manifested form of Anam is an enormous humanoid, well over 100 feet tall, a giant with flowing white hair and a regal beard, wearing deep blue robes and carrying a staff of power which he keeps loaded up with wishes. Anam personifies his son's defining traits to an almost unbelievable extreme. He's remarkably selfish, sees all others as hopelessly inferior to himself, and cares not a jot about the passage of time. He ponders things deeply, and once he has made up his mind, he will never change his opinion, even in the face of new evidence or further developments. Anam has a dual nature. On the one hand, he is wise, learned, and philosophical. On the other, he is lustful, instinctive, and unpredictable. Equally notorious are his insight and his jealousy, his wit and impatience. He is proud of both his divine and terrestrial children and all they've accomplished, but still he has seen a future that he cannot prepare them for. In fact, he has left Toril completely in the hands of his children and vowed not to return until Astoria has once more been restored. We shall talk about what prompted this later in the video. Anam's only benefit still bestowed to his priesthood is a single vision they receive during their lives at any time which is absolutely accurate and extremely important to the destiny of their race. The leader of the entire giant religion, the Stormazin, is the most skilled among all their clerics, and also the only one who speaks with the authority of Anam, and thus for all the giant gods. Anam's message, his faith and manifesto, is that the giants are destined to rule Faerun as they were always intended to, and that they must honour the ordering of their gods and the ordering of their people, and that they must never raise a hand against a brother giant, and they must be peace between all giant breeds in order to see Anam's prophecies to their fruition, and that a restored Astoria is the only hope for Toril, as the dragons are now free of the Dracorage curse and the giants are much declined, it seems that this could be a hopeless task for the race of giants. Only time will tell. But time is something Anam tells his children not to fear. It is the bane of their enemies, whom they should never let distract them from their destiny, but also never underestimate or dismiss out of hand. Anam's avatar never visits and manifests on the world of Toril. The moment it does, it will signal that Astoria is once more supreme and the race of dragons' time on the world is about to come to a brutal end. Anam is directly honoured in three ceremonies still practised by the giants. The first day of the first month of each year sees the grand feast of the Allfather, the Onurn. During this celebration, all giants temporarily abrogate their other responsibilities and partake of a vast quantity of food and to celebrate the eventual return of Astorian glory. Although the ceremony differs somewhat from breed to breed, based largely on each breed's view of Anam, most tribes demonstrate the unity by dispatching ambassadors to attend each other's celebrations. Typically, the Stormazin honours a favoured chieftain by attending the feast held at that chieftain's steading. Once every two years, the Stormazin holds a special ceremony in Anam's honour to invest new clergymen. This ceremony is typically held in one of the larger tribe's dedicated temples and attended by the chieftains of all the various tribes. A tribe whose temple is so selected by the Stormazin is greatly honoured by this. Once per month, the Stormazin holds a special prayer vigil to honour the Allfather and ask his guidance. Particularly troubled members of the Jotun brood often visit the Stormers' shrine in order to attend the ceremony. Any priest or shaman of Anam who strikes another giant willingly or unwillingly must forfeit his position and undergo divestiture of his role as a priest or shaman. Anyone who speaks Ulutiu's name at a ceremony honouring Anam must die. We will discuss who Ulutiu is toward the end of the video, or perhaps in a later video where I'll talk about the, uh, the relationship between Othir and Anam and Ulutiu. Gudheim is Anam's vast palace, crystal palace, located on the plain of Isgard. At its centre is a splendid orrery, a model of the plains, stars and planets that endlessly spin, spins on silent we, uh, gears of perfection. Although Anam has not set foot in Gudheim since he made his pact with Othir, the palace is still occupied by his celestial children, the remaining members of the divine ordning. Giant priests believe that just before their deaths, particularly pious clergymen are invited to visit Gudheim on one evening to share a repast with the divine ordning. Surrounding Gudheim is Jotunheim, the home of the giant heroes. According to ancient legends, the spirits of all giants who die in battle are carried off to Jotunheim by Muspel and Muznir a pair of Anam servants who often take the shape of enormous owls. There they are allowed to pursue their chosen virtues and defend their ordning for all eternity. Twilight's Vale is a barren valley located on the northern fringe of the ice spires. 
Because it was used as a meeting place by Adam's son in the time of ancient Astoria, the Jotun brood have long considered the Vale to be sacred ground. To this day, the giants of the spires actively defend its valley against interlopers and trespassers. Stron Mors is the eldest son of Anan and the brother to Hyatia, Grolantor, Memnor, Scoraeus, and Elanus. Shortly after he came of age, Stron Mors adopted the skies as his purview. With Anam gone, however, he is now responsible for the affairs of the entire Ordning, though he certainly doesn't div- uh, covet his father's power. The moment Anam returns, Strawn Mors will happily relinquish his throne. Though he is often encountered among the mountains of the Beastlands, the Peaceful Mountains, Strawn Mors is believed to inhabit a spectacular cloud palace attached to Anam's steading in Goodheim. At the centre of this palace is a magical opal pool some 500 feet long, to a viewer but of endless size to anyone swimming within it. The waters of this pool completely heal any creature who bathes in them. I've got my own theory that uh, this is actually a portal to the ocean of Celestia. Many thousands of years ago, after the titan uh, Lanaxus finally united all of Anam's son on Toril, Strawn Moors gave Lanaxus a sample of his waters as a gift, allowing the titan to create a smaller version of the pond at the centre of Vonenheim. In fact, Lilanus delivered his poison to Othea by fouling waters drawn from this magical font, but more on her portrayal later. Whether or not the fountain still exists in the heart of Vonenheim's ruins buried beneath tons of ice and rock, of course, is unknown. Like all members of the Ordning, each of the giant's breeds tends to see Strawnmoors in a different light. To the hill giants, he is a mighty fisherman. To the frost giants, he is a bold sailor and explorer. To the cloud giants, he is a thundering god of storms. In any case, all who see him as, uh, they seem as far more youthful, vigorous and carefree than their all-father. Strawnmoors is frequently depicted smiling or reveling and he almost always seems to be enjoying crafting his powerful rainstorms and lightning bolts. Because he's so adventurous, Strawnmoors tends to send more avatars to visit Toril than many of his divine peers. Often these avatars as disguised as ordinary storm giants travelling between the steadings. Though he would never dream of blatantly and directly intervening in the fears of the Jotun Brood, he and his siblings made certain rules against such vulgar interventions eons ago due to the, well, the disruption it causes their, uh, their terrestrial cousins because of their personal bickerings and rivalries. He frequently intervenes indirectly to enjoy adventures aside his favoured nephews. Strawn Moors also dispatches his avatars simply to take pleasure in Toril's idyllic forests and isolated mountains. Strawn Moors' avatar appears as an 80 foot tall giant with blue eyes and flowing red hair, wearing a simple white robe. Cloud giants devoted to Strawn Moors begin each morning by scattering handfuls of incense and spices to the winds. About twice per year they worship their patron by declaring a sacred omjag or sky hunt on an evil of an evil air creature such as a chimera, wyvern or chromatic dragon. The beast is then ritually hunted, killed and offered to Strawn Moors. In stark contrast to their brothers, the storm giant followers of Strawn Moors view the god's ever-present smile as a form of mockery. They worship their patron by organising great ceremonies designed to demonstrate their ability to overcome earthly obstacles such as a great quest, a hunt or a survival walk. Often these rituals press the giants to the limits of their abilities and place them in great mortal danger. Storm giant followers of Strawn Moors also preach that all sins require atonement and offer absolution to their brethren in the form of mild physical punishment. Regardless of their breed, Priests of Strawn Moors always stop to pray during or immediately after a rainstorm or thunderstorm, even a storm summoned by priests themselves. Devotees are also forbidden to build fires, though there are no restrictions against them warming themselves at the fires built by others. The cloud giant priests are skilled in music and arts. They wear fine jewellery and maintain large personal fortunes. Storm giant priests of Strawn Moors, on the other hand, are shabbily dressed ascetics. Before they are accepted into the order, they must sit atop a cold, deserted peak for 100 days and nights without food. Few things on Toril are as hungry as a storm giant acolyte crawling down the mountain after that epic fasting. They are weak, absolutely, but beware the power of their faith. Hyatia is the daughter of Anam and sister to Strawn Moors, Grolantor, Elanus, Memnor, and Scoraeus. After she and her siblings developed an interest in the Jotun breed on Toril, she claimed dominion over its hearths and its fields, developing a strong influence over both agriculture and family life in the Jotunrood society. Just after the war with the dragons reached its bitter conclusion, Strawn Moors 
taunted Hayatira about her uselessness during the affair, prompting her to undergo a stunning transformation. To establish the might of her domain, Hayatia reinvented herself as an avenging huntress, capable of employing nature as both a powerful weapon of destruction as well as a peaceful source of bounty. Though Stronmores has apologised since for the incident, Hayatia has never just uh, forgotten it. She is now fiercely committed to maintaining a dual nature, nurturer and destroyer, reaper and sower. Hayatia is the only member of the Ordning still worshipped by the Voidkin, the elf-like giantkin who fled the Ice Spire several centuries ago. More on them in a future video on the series. Hayatia rarely sends avatars to the Prime Material Plane. Very rarely she'll dispatch a direct uh, assistant to her devotees. And from time to time she manifests herself on Toril to hunt some notoriously ferocious creature. She does, however, communicate uh, unusually often with her priests and shamans in the form of direct omens, distinctive most of which are somehow linked with fire, burning buildings, flaming spears, fiery auras, uh, encircling familiar objects. The flame beetles are all commonly employed. Such omens are usually dispatched to warn the wicked of her ire. Hyatia's avatar appears as a tanned, long-legged, 70-foot tall giantess wearing leather armor and carrying a spear and a bow, very Athena-like, with golden red hair tied back from her face, clearly exposing her hazel eyes. Hayatia's priests are usually, though not always, female. She has devoted followings among the fire giants and stone giants of the ice spires, as well as the Vodkin. Generally, priests of Hayatia assume one of two roles. Some spend most of their time in the steadings and function as family counsellors and spiritual advisors. Others live alone or in small groups in the wilderness, where they act as sentries and guardians for the kingdom of Hartsvale and the various giant steadings there. Though there is no disgrace in joining the urban faction, the wilderness priests are considered closer to their goddess. Hayatia is said to select these sentry priests herself, subtly steering them into her service. The highest priests of her sect are always outsiders who visit the settings only to issue orders to the home clerics. Approximately once per month, the priests of the settings accompany the sentinel priests and the faithful on a ceremonial hunt, bonding. Once per year, usually in the spring, the party selects a particularly challenging creature to hunt in this fashion. The priests of Hayatia who live in the setting strongly recommend that all the tribes, uh, Hasleda, or family groups, Keep the priests well advised of developments in their family lives. Making important family decisions without the counsel of the priest is considered a minor sin by Hayatia's faithful. The goddess spends, uh, she spreads the ethos that nature is both creator and destroyer. Through the reawaking of Astoria is the destiny of all Jotunbrood, there are some prices too high to pay even for this lofty goal. The mission of defeat is the, is the very worst fate that can befall a true child of the Ordning. Though the giant can are not the true blood and can never claim an equal status in Jotunbrood society, they are of the faith and should always be welcome in the settings of true giants, which would well be one of the most often ignored divine credos of the giant gods, or at least the word welcome is very much a subject to uh, nuance in regard to the true giants and the giant kin. Grolantor, along with his brother Memnor, uh, they are the two most troublesome of Anam's children with the unnamed sky goddess, so much so that he has prohibited them from involving themselves in the affairs of the Jotunbrood while he was still here. Now that Anam has left Gudheim, however, his decree is no longer applicable, or at least they have uh, appealed to their siblings. Once free to roam Toril in the wake of his father's exile, Rolantor started sending his avatar amongst the Jotunbrood, hoping to persuade the giants to accompany them on his mischievous outings. Naturally, he received the warmest response from the hill giants and frost giants who most admire Rolantor's pride, courage, and skill in battle. Neither Stronmores nor Hayatia is very pleased with Rolantor's activities, though neither feels empowered to put a stop to them. Rolantor is wholly dedicated to his own conceit. He absolutely refuses to admit that any other being or deity is his superior and tries to instill this attitude in his followers. Without such pride, he believes Astoria could never be reborn. Needless to say, such impetuousness has made him a number of enemies, particularly the gods of the Dwarven Pantheon, most of whom attack Rolantor on sight. He has a habit of sending his 25 foot tall dragon hide clad avatar to his followers, taking the form of whatever dominant giant breed is present inciting them to war on some enemy force. He then loses interests and abandons his followers at a critical moment of the battle, which his faithful then proclaim as a glorious opportunity to prove their worthiness, but just as often proves to be a complete slaughter. The priests of Grolantor are never allowed back down to, uh, never allowed to back down from a battle or a challenge. Failure means that the priest loses all divine powers until they undergo atonement. 
usually by charging headlong into an even more dangerous battle. Following his credo, Corlantor's priests take it upon themselves to search for and eradicate perceived weakness in their societies. Whenever they hold positions of respect, they are constantly urging their chieftains to launch invasions and raiding parties, sometimes in the face of astronomical odds. Favourite targets for Gorilantor's clergy include dwarves, dragons and goblins. Gorilantor's faithful have a habit of out-eating or out-drinking any of the giant in the tribe, plus they are well known for going berserk in combat and inspiring the same ferocity in others. When Memnor and his brother Gorilantor were just children, their play resulted in a mischievous plot that ultimately thrust the entire Jotun brood into a minor war against the ogres. As a consequence, Anim forbade his children from interfering in the affairs of the giants. However, they are now just as active since Anam's departure, perhaps even more so, sometimes, sometimes forcing strong moors or higher tier to put an end to their shenanigans. Memnor is subtle, charming, intelligent, cultured and deeply, intensely cruel. His sin is pride, the desire to eventually usurp Anam's throne atop the Ordning and become lord over all the others of giant kind. His chosen instruments in executing these plans are a handful of evil cloud giants he has accepted into his priesthood, his cronies. To most members of the Jotunbrood, Memnor is a proud and determined servant of his father. Only his priests know the truth, and they share his ambition. Memnor is sneaky and wily, and rarely sends avatars to Toril to fight, though his avatars will fight rashly if their pride is challenged. They always appear as a kindly, golden-skinned, 20-foot-tall giant with piercing eyes and wearing a deep blue robe. He looks quite a lot like Anam is represented because in many ways he seeks to replace Anam and he believes that Oristoria's collapse is due to Anam's own ineptitude. He also advocates victory via cunning and secrecy and surprise. Memnor's clerics hold feasts in his honour for the mainstream of giant society three times per year. Among themselves, the clerics meet with Memnor's avatar and his wyvern servants on an isolated crag at midnight on every hundredth day. At these meetings, the faithful discuss strategy and receive the orders from their master. Perhaps the most important duty of Memnor's servants is keeping his true ambitions a secret. Just after the Stormerson accepts them into the clergy of the Ordning, Memnor's own high priest visits each of the new recruits and subjects them to his own secret ceremony. During this shocking rite, the initiates pledge to aid their master in his bid to seize Anam's throne and to swear to keep their true plans secret from the uninitiated. Their inner circle has a secret hand sign that they employ to identify each other and also to communicate messages secretly to each other. While operating within the mainstream of Jotunbrood society, Memnor's clerics play the role of wise counsellors and advocates for the underprivileged. In reality, they are always looking for an opportunity to ascend the ordnings of the various giant societies, where they will more, be more useful to their master and manipulating and scheming uh, for Memnor. You can identify the high-ranking priests of Memnor by the Wyvern Talon charm they wear when they magically summon a Wyvern th several, uh, th uh, up to three times per day. Though the Wyvern still needs to actually fly to their location when called, so sometimes it can take a while. In stark contrast to Memnor and Gorlantor, Ilanis is a favoured daughter of Anam, one of the youngest of, at the time Anam sired the first terrestrial giants. She was introduced to the Open Brood while basically still a teenager by goddess standards. Ilana's avatar appears as a graceful, fair-skinned, 25-foot-tall giantess wearing a bright crest made entirely from living flowers. Ilana's advocates love, forgiveness, beauty and mercy. She never turns a giant of a good nature from her flock. Her ultimate ambition is to reunite all of the Oaten Brood and re-establish Astoria as a kingdom of benevolence, ambition and learning. Ilanus is particularly beloved by the stone giants, cloud giants and storm giants, and the kin of the ice spires. She often dispatches her avatar to join a celebration of joy alongside the Oaten Brood and sends signals and signs to her faithful in the form of pleasant smells, rare flowers and tinkling winds. So if you go to a particularly famous chieftain's wedding for instance, there will be out of season blooms of rare flowers that spot up all around the uh, wedding ceremony and they're seen as blessed and so you'd be very ill advised to pick them. Ilanus priests forego any worldly possessions beyond those necessary to maintain their own modest existence and live by the example of their goddess, to honour mercy above all save the gods, honour beauty above all save mercy. Kindness is the milk of might, passion is the milk of life, an evil deed never goes unpunished nor a good deed unrewarded. Priests of Elanus always say a prayer over any gift or meal they receive. They also conduct nearly all of the marriage ceremonies that take place between two members of the Open Brood, even those involving priests of other deities or 
giants of an evil alignment. They don't judge. Each year, on the first day of spring, all of Elanus's priests assemble in one of the giant steadings for a grand revelry. If possible, a marriage is performed at the height of the celebration, since a marriage performed under these circumstances is considered a great honour among the Jotunbrut. Most of the important members of Jotunbrut's society wait until the spring ceremony to actually get married. Scoraeus is yet another of Anam's sons. Unlike most of his siblings, he is generally disinterested in the affairs of the Jotunbrut as a whole, although he is obsessed with the stone giants in particular, and often interferes in their affairs in order to guide their development. Scoraeus is knowledgeable about runes, banes, magics, and the legends of great treasures buried in the Underdark. His chosen sphere is artistic advancement and achievement. Although generally expressionless, dour, and something of a loner, Scoraeus has been known to occasionally consort with the gods of the dwarves and this first nebly deep gnomes. His avatar, on the rare occasion he manifests one on Toril, is a huge, granite-skinned stone giant with thick, powerful arms. He has shown up in stone giant legends to lead them to new homes or fabulous magical treasures. Otherwise, he sends omens through natural beauty such as brightly coloured rocks, strange stalactite patterns, sparkling fountains and the like. His priests see a whole world of meaning in the raw caverns of the Underdark, alive with meaning and communication from their god. His manifesto is evident in the world all around them. That beauty is truth. Knowledge is power. The affairs of outsiders serve only to distract the faithful from matters of true importance and that a secret is a source of power, one which the Underdark has untold amounts of. Scoraeus' priests tend to isolate themselves from the remainder of their tribe, spending most of their time meditating and creating intricate sculptures and friezes. They feel it is their duty to oversee affairs in the Stone Giant Society and guarantee that the Stone Giants constantly progress to greater works of art and greater intellectual discoveries. In accordance with Scoraeus' teaching, the priests believe the best way to accomplish these aims is to keep the Stone Giants as isolated as possible from the other intelligent races of Faerun, save those few representatives of such races that might add to the giant's mastery of craftships, craftsmanship and law. Uh, although contact with other Jotunbrood tribes is tolerated, Scoraeus' priests strongly urge that the tribes shun contact with other peoples, lest infidels distract from, from their purpose. And it has had a long-term effect that the stone giants are the longest lived and closest to their elemental nature of all the stone uh, of all the giant breeds so it actually has had a major effect on their culture approximately once every three months the priests of Scoraeus venture down into the underdark alone and without food four days later they always return none the worse for wear these journeys are said to be far-flung vision quests during which Scoraeus supplies them uh, with messages and instructions in the form of omens and dreams the clerics of Scoraeus require any giant who violates the god's teachings to atone through meditation of one to five hours even those who have pledged their allegiance to other deities tend to follow this custom whenever they are visiting or occupying one of Scoraeus' strongholds just to humour the gods' clergy, because failure to obey the custom often brings loud, frequent and annoying rebukes from the priests, which don't cease. I'll talk about the gods of the lesser giant kin, such as Baphomet and Vaprak, in a future video in the series, but for now, this concludes our exploration of the religion of the giants, and as I mentioned, I'll be talking about the betrayal of Anam by Othea with her uh, relationship with Ulutir and the giant kin that resulted from her mating with other beings. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.